new day dawning, sound of singing filling the air. Today is day one of the remainder of your lives. Do you ever think that? You wake up in the morning, all this stuff was filling your life the day before. Day one, a new beginning every morning. And uh, let this day be a day when we say yes to God as he reveals his will to us. That song, There's a Wind A-Blowing All Across the Land, I don't know what it does for you, because at, the, at one level, God isn't mentioned, Jesus isn't mentioned, but it touches my spirit, because there's a sense of hope. There's a sense that actually things, whatever, however they've been, can be different. There's a sense that God is moving, initiating, bringing change, breaking through, and... Um, I don't know why we sing the last um, verse so where we say there's a fire burning from the sky. Do we know what we're singing? You know, but anyway, <laughs> we won't, won't dwell there. But, but there's a rain of pouring, showers from above. Mercy drops are coming, mercy drops of love. Turn your face to heaven, let the water pour. Let it pour. Let it pour over me, oh sweet rain, come and pour over me. And in Deuteronomy, there's this interesting text where God says to his people, the land which I'm bringing you in to possess is not like the land of Egypt where you watered the ground with, the, you know, basically with the strength of their own legs. They dug a, a channel with their feet or with some instrument from the Nile and they flooded the fields. That was its water supply. It says, the land I'm bringing you to possess is a land of hills and valleys that drinks its rain from heaven. It drinks its rain from heaven. It's not like wherever you've come from. Some of us come into the Christian experience and we're still busy doing this. It doesn't work anymore. We're not in that place at all. It is a completely different land. And it's a land where things begin to happen as we lift our our, our eyes to heaven as we allow the rain to come. And that word allow is really important because God doesn't impose himself upon us. There is an interaction. So as we gather today, in Jesus' name, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the living God is here. And he's shining his light. And he's opening the truth of his word to us. He's revealing who Jesus is. He's revealing what Jesus has done and what he is doing right now. Do you know those bracelets that people say, what would Jesus do? I was never comfortable with that. I wanted it to be, what is Jesus doing? What is Jesus doing? To actually have an awareness, uh, open eyes, open ears, to be able to have my spiritual faculties so alerted and opened and tuned in to what God was doing that I could then cooperate with him. And that's what God wants for us all. And I'm, I'm convinced, you know, I've been brooding over this for a few weeks now, and I'm convinced that God wants to speak deeply into the heart of Perfect Gateway yeah. regarding this issue of revelation. And I know it's something that Paul, has often, he often speaks about revelation. And by that I mean not the book of Revelation, but I mean um, when actually God opened something that was previously closed to us. Well, you know, we sang last week, was it, I once was blind, but now I see. There's something that God is doing of actually resensitizing us or sensitizing us perhaps for the first time to the reality of the spirit realm. You know, we, from an early age, have been told we have five senses, yeah? What do we have? Sight, taste, touch, hearing, smell. Anyone who has read the Holy Scriptures know that's completely false or completely inadequate, at least. It's certainly not five, and maybe ten, maybe fifteen, if you read the whole of Scripture. The, the way in which Jesus operated as he was connected with Father, as his eyes were open to see what Father was doing, as his ears was, were open to hear what God, oh God, he was operating on a completely different level. Who is blind like my servant? It's like Jesus didn't even need to open his eyes. He didn't even need to listen to what was happening around him. 
because he could hear what Father was saying and he could see what the Father was doing. And he, in a place of rest, simply joined with him. Simply joined with him. Simply found his place in what God was doing. Life in the Spirit is a life of seeing and hearing things which cannot be seen or heard in the natural. Life in the Spirit is a life of seeing and hearing things which cannot be seen, cannot be heard in the natural. And we're thankful to have physical eyes that still work and ears that still, or some of the times, sometimes when I'm in the, in, the, um, in, in the evening when the kids are talking, family together over lunch, I have to really strain to hear because sometimes they speak very quietly, but my hearing isn't perfect, neither are my eyes, but I'm so thankful for that. But when we're born of the Spirit of God, we're enabled to see with our spiritual eyes, we're enabled to hear with our spiritual ears, God opens that which was closed. And hallelujah. Yeah. Imagine having to go along with our five senses in this world, you know. But you know, even in the secular world, they, they, they acknowledge, they may not call it the spirit, they talk about discernment and perception and all that. There's a whole lot more going on, isn't there? But God wants us to understand and live in the reality of that. You know, actually, our eyes are opened. We're not just looking at things in the way they appear to us. We're not just listening to the words that are, or the sounds around us, but we're tuning into God. Nowadays, um, in, a, you know, in prayer, I don't know what it's like for you, if you're ministering to somebody, my biggest challenge is to shut down what, I'm, what I can see. And my biggest challenge is to shut down what I can hear, because often there are a lot of distracting indicators of what the problem is. If I can manage to do that and I can manage to tune in to God, then it's simple. It's a simple word that's spoken into that situation, or it's a, a manner of ministry. And it was given by God. It wasn't me figuring it out based upon data, based on revelation. Yeah. And as I want to say, it's, it's, um, I don't know what this sounds like so far on page one, but this is rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, I'm gentle and lowly of heart and you'll find rest for your souls. When we cease to do our work based upon the stuff that's, um, you know, our five senses and whatever, however we've learned to survive in the past and allow God to do his work through us and in us, it's restful, it's peaceful. The complex becomes, I wouldn't say simple, as in childish, but uh, simple and uh, it, it clarifies and such in such a way that a child can understand it. And didn't Jesus say that? Unless you become like little children, you will not see or enter the kingdom of God. Paul, in his um, recent, uh, you know, his three-minute messages, um, reading read, spoke about Peter. They, it came a certain point where Jesus said to them, but how about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, he jumps in all the time, doesn't he? I love him. He said, you're the Christ, the son of a living God. And Jesus' um, response was really, really interesting, and it's key, and it's all about what I'm talking to you about. He said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. He reminded him of his physical descent. Because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You just said something that didn't come from your environment, your upbringing, or anything like that, your, your learning, your nurture, whatever. God himself revealed it to you. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And however, however much the Catholic Church may say Peter's the rock, it's the revelation that is the rock upon which Jesus Christ will build his church. Revelation, where things are revealed about what Father's doing and what Father is saying. There is, hear me, there is and there can be no substitute for the revelation of God in our Christian life. I've tried it. I've tried it. Unless we are 
moving in the life and flow of what God is revealing moment by moment, all we'll find is ourselves frustrated and we'll see barrenness. We won't see fruit coming out of our endeavour. And, um, and what are we talking about? Talk about communion. What do we say in, in the, you know, at the end of some services and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you? This is all about just walking with God. Proverbs 20 verse 12 says this, The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. Nothing more, just that. And I believe this is also talking about when God himself opens our eyes, when God himself opens our ears so that we can see and hear, it transforms everything. Yeah. And we're no longer in this routine of religion, we're in this dynamic and exciting flow of the Spirit. And it's, this isn't something, I don't know what it sounds like to you, as if, oh no, this is for the super spiritual level. No, no, this is for sons and daughters, and we're going to see that. Let's turn together to, um, so I just want to explore this theme. I've just presented a brief summary, but let's explore it together. Let's turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 6. And I hope I'll hear a, a rustle of pages, like I was saying last time, you know, how, how good it would be for us to be restored to make a use of our, our Bibles rather than our gadgets. Um, Acts 2, verse 1 to 6. Now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord, with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, we've been singing about it. It filled the, holy ha uh, the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, um, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Where did the disciples learn those languages? They didn't. They were given by the Spirit. Languages of angels, languages of men, uh, later Paul says in Corinthians. Um, the Spirit gave them utterance, verse 4. And uh, let's move forward for a second time to verse 14. They will start, some of them start to make fun of them and say, oh, they're just filled with new wine, you know. And uh, Peter, standing up with the eleven, I oh, always think that's proof that they played cricket in those days. <laughs> um, Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Heed my words, for these not are, are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it's uh, one of the reasons why Joel, my son, is called Joel, this scripture. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I love this text. I don't know what it's like for the women here um, being part of church. I don't know what it's been like for you growing up in, in church systems where often women are in some contexts whitewashed, women are not given equal opportunity um, by tradition, no, no, there's no intent of, um, you know, of actually holding women back in any way. But when it comes to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, God says here, and he spoke it into the religious system of its day, and said, I will pour out my spirit, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And, um, and then he goes, says again, my, on, on my men servants and on my maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, verse 18. And there's a key that 1 Samuel 9, verse 9 gives us here. It says this, 
Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, Come, and let us go to the seer. Come, let us go to the seer. For the one who is now a prophet was formerly called a seer. I find that really helpful. <laughs> I don't know about you. Because of the connotation of prophet, prophecy and the ministry of a prophet, it makes it seem like um, a little bit of specialist ministry, you know, and for a few and not for all. But Joel says it's for all. Or did I misread? It says it's for all, doesn't it? Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. My men servants and my maid servants shall prophesy as because of the result of the coming of the Spirit. But let's link it with 1 Samuel. They shall become seers. They shall begin to see what the natural eye cannot see. And if we relate it to other scriptures, they'll begin to hear the inaudible. <laughs> Seeing and hearing that which the natural five senses type model. There's, there's nothing there. And um, this is really key, I believe. And if you've studied the scriptures, you know, when God's talking with Jeremiah and Amos and Zechariah, he'd interact with them like this and say, what do you see? And he said, well, I, I see a boiling pot pouring out towards the north, or something like that. You know, what do you see? So he's sort of, God is actually interacting, revealing something to him, and he's, he's asking, now reflect back to me, what are you seeing? And then he would reveal his word, and so on, you know. And so seeing is all this, you know, comes as a result of being baptised, filled with the Spirit, anointed by the Spirit, um, to be able to, enable, enabling you to, work with God, co-labour with him. Let's think of Moses as an example of a seer. Have you ever, I don't know if you've studied the life of Moses, it's just absolutely phenomenal, his encounter with God. Deuteronomy 34, verse 10. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Face to face. I spend most of my time on virtual meetings, you know, and, and uh, oh, you know, it's so, it's so refreshing when I actually get a chance to engage with people face to face. I don't find it as easy, by the way. I don't find it as easy. But inside, I just think, yeah, this is right. That it should be actually face to face with those that I'm communicating with. And Exodus 33, verse 11, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man spoke to his friend. And Hebrews 11, 27. <coughs> um, well done for those who are trying to follow and keep up in the word. I should be doing that to give us time to think. Um, Hebrews eleven twenty seven is an absolutely wonderful word. By faith, Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Isn't that beautiful? You know, how did Moses keep going back to Pharaoh? How did he, you know, in all the disappointment and all the powers and all, all the ways in which uh, Moses, uh, you know, um, all the witchcraft and all the stuff that was going on there, how did he do it? Well, he endured because he could see the one who was invisible. So Moses was like a seer extraordinary, you know. And in the end, there was one time he spent 40 days and 40 nights up a mountain, no drink, no either food nor water, came back down, and what was his face like? Glowing. He'd, he'd actually been in the very presence of God, and they had to put a veil over his face because everyone was terrified. Who is this person who had been, you know, and, and that was as a result of encountering God face to face. So Moses from the outset, from the calling, was a seer. He was an incredible prophet, and he spoke not only into his own situation and the powers that be, but he also spoke many words of prophecy regarding the land of Israel and the people of Israel, which are still being worked out today. So when the Spirit is poured out, God's servants become prophets. They become seers, able to see the invisible, 
able to hear the inaudible, and it's, cr it's critical. I don't know about you, I, I came, to, came to the Lord at 20, 27, was it 28, 20, what age, I always forget, 27. My wife knows these things. Um, and um, so, so, so often I'd be, you know, and I'd be in a position of, um, you know, trying to help somebody or do something worthwhile in the kingdom to make my, make my contribution. But as I look back, I think, good grief. Thank God, God, God protected everybody. Because I was just, it was, you know, I would just think, oh, I'd read a text and I'd be going after that. And that, you know, if I just held on to that and spoke that and did that, then everything would be all right. Not at all. It was all flesh. Maybe there was a little bit, you know. Um, because gradually, as time went by, as God dealt with the insecurities, he's still working on those, um, and I was be able to begin to start to relax a little bit and begin to trust God a little bit, then I realised his revelation was flowing to me. It wasn't striving, it wasn't, it wasn't stressful. It was me simply lifting my eyes and receiving the rain falling from heaven in a place of rest. And nowadays, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just astonished. When I look back now, how I, I've been, and I don't want to make, paint it too bleak, because there's always been mountaintop valleys. I remember being on mission in Mexico, and um, we, we had a line of people, I mean, three times the length of this room, and they were coming in couples, because we were ministering into, 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 <laughs> into marriages yeah. and the stuff that was there yeah. and I um, was in uh, and I was just a servant coming under the leadership of a ministry team there's a, a group of Americans but the revelation was just flowing yeah. <laughs> and one couple I've never seen them before in my life I just speak a word and they were just going into release and deliverance, some of them, you know, just all sorts of things going on, a huge variety of things. And I was, I was there and I was participating, doing the, you know, I was doing my bit. But it's revelation. It's rest. It wasn't me striving. I come back to the UK thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to be, you know, it's going to be so amazing. I bring this back to the local church. Dead as doornails. <laughs> Serious, it was very strange. God anointed me for that ministry in that nation under, you know, with a totally different pin, um, structure of principality and power and rights of the enemy and all the rest of it. And in that place, I, I experienced incredible rest and an incredible flow of revelation. And I was able to actually just pray for person after person after person. No big dramatic, no, I, I had that sort of ministry, you know, but, but it was just something that was just so, and I look back on it now, and I think. It was so restful, Lord. Mm. And I want us to realise that each of us are able to actually live in that space. We looked at Moses. Um, but, you know, we could look at so many more, don't you? Maybe already you're thinking about people whose got eyes got opened. We see Hagar fleeing from her mistress and... Uh, her son was going to die, she was going to die, they were in a desert space, there was no water. And she just separated herself from the son, let me not look upon the death of my son. God appeared to her, opened her eyes and she saw a well. Did God create the well? I don't know. But, but he, the key thing is he opened her eyes. And suddenly a situation where there was potential death became life and flow, you know, a, place, a source of water. We see Balaam, and let's turn to this. Balaam, um, I'm sorry, not Balaam, Numbers 22. Numbers 22. This is just so incredible. So incredible. Now, Balaam was a quite a dodgy character. Um, for those of you who have studied, you know, the background to who, the, who he is or looked at what he got up to, he was a, almost like a wizard. There's a whole mixture, and yet he knew the Lord. But he resorted to all sorts of dodgy ways of receiving revelation. 
were actually coming into that space where he could curse. The, the king of Moab said, whom you curse, they're cursed. Come and curse this way. So where, what is it about, where did he get his power from? Where did he get that um, corrupt anointing from? Because the enemy always imitates what God does. Um, he did it in a whole mixture of ways. And But look at Numbers 22.31. Numbers 22.31. What we're thinking about here is God opening our eyes. God opening our eyes. Isn't there a song that says, Open my eyes, Lord, I want to see Jesus. And uh, my prayer this morning is that the Lord will open our eyes and in that opening, in the revelation that comes, we follow him. Yeah? yeah. And we're gonna that's where we're gonna end up if if I manage to uh, uh, so twenty uh, twenty two thirty one. Um, then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. So do you remember the time when he was going to go with the kings of Moab to curse them? And there was an, an angel in the path of, of Balaam. He couldn't see it. The donkey could see it. And, um, and he, he would have been slain if he carried on, but God opened his eyes. Then we just turn a few pages to 24, verse 3 and 4. Then he took up this oracle and said, The utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes opened wide. Look at that. Man whose eyes are opened the utterance of him who hears the words of God and who sees the vision of the Almighty. And what was the effect? Fell on his face with the, that revelation. And he realized this course that he was on, which was basically all the reward that the, the princes of Moab had promised him. He just said, no, 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 I'm not going to go there. <laughs> and, we, and then um, if we turn to... Um, yeah, let, let's think. Do you remember another time? Let's move away from for the sake of time. Let's move away to think about Elisha. Do you remember the time? 2 Kings 6.17, if you want to turn to it. Again, another beautiful text. Incredible. But I, I don't know if you're New Testament Christians, but I don't mean that in any offensive way, but I, I meet a lot of um, Christians who, for whatever reason, culturally or whatever, they spend much more time in the New Testament uh, scriptures and they do in the Tanakh in uh, what we call the Old Testament scriptures. Um, the whole, you know, at the time when Paul said to Timothy um, that the word of God is, um, what's that script? How did it go? Um, is useful for doctrine, for correction, etc., and training in righteousness. Guess which scriptures he was talking about? The Tanakh. <laughs> the New Testament hadn't been written. We need to get back to, uh, Jesus spells it out in Luke uh, 24, but we'll go. But 2 Kings 6.17, when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the, the city with horses, chariots, and his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he, he's looking out, looking out with the natural eyes, looking at that situation, and he's saying, good grief, there's no hope for us, you know. No hope for us. And uh, Elisha said, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And he then prayed, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the eyes of a young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. <laughs> so, wonderful example. What do you see in the natural? What is actually there? Because, you know, we, we are spiritual beings. We, live in, we have a soul. We live in a body. 
But how dominant is the body? <laughs> but actually we are spiritual beings. Spirit first, soul, body. And um, we need to, and I believe it's God's intention, that each one of us, I don't know if anybody's here saying, I wonder when this guy's going to stop. And um, This is for you. There's nobody excluded here. God wants every one of us to be free, to receive, to drink, to move in into a place of rest, to move into a place of revelation about what Father's doing, about what Father's saying. And then just simply as his child joining with him in it. Am I making it sound so simple? Is it not difficult? In reality, doesn't the flesh rise up against it? Don't our habit of a lifetime get in the way? Yeah. Um, the opening of eyes, the opening of ears, is a fundamental work of Jesus, the Messiah today. So what's he doing this morning? His intention is to open our eyes and open our ears to the reality that is the spiritual realm. And it's happening at many different levels. Even to bring about salvation and deliverance in anybody, God needs first to open them to their condition and needs to bring them to his revelation. So um, we see that um, you know, the, the word of the Lord is pure, converting the soul. And Paul, Paul says that the, the law of God is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So it, you know, there is this sense in which even to come to God, we need God to open. To come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we need God to show us our condition. I guess, I guess we've all experienced that, didn't we? And that led us on that pathway of repentance and change, willfully choosing to go in a different direction. Please could we sing in this church soon, Charles Wesley and, um, and Can It Be? In the, in the previous place, we sang a lot of Charles Wesley, as long as, uh, along with other new songs, but the, the words of this song. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray, I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. I, I love it. It's not complete, of course, but what I love about it is the recognition that the chains have gone. And the ability to rise up and follow Jesus. Many people are stuck. They don't understand, they don't believe, they haven't received that the chains are broken. <coughs> the chains are broken and they stay in the prison cell. And it's once one of the most tragic things I encounter in the body. Christians, long, you know, for many, many years, still struggling with stuff that they could just simply say no to. You just simply say no. I remember once there was a, a sermon at uh, um, Sunnydale Baptist Church where, and it was recounting a situation that they, they, they'd been in where there was a guy who repeatedly um, committed adultery, repeatedly was unfaithful to his wife, and, one, and he was a Christian, and one day a prophet, somebody who saw and heard what God was saying, came to him and he said, next, day you do, next time you do it, you will drop dead. The guy never committed adultery again. <laughs> he never did it. Which just showed that he could have stopped at any time. He just needed to decide to let it go. Isaiah 42, if you have a scripture, please let's take a moment to turn to this. Uh, Isaiah 42. What is the ministry of Jesus? How would you summarise it? Can it be summarised? <laughs> Isaiah 42, verse 1 to 7. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. 
I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, smoking flax he will not quench. Isn't that beautiful? He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastland shall wait for his instruction. Often we, we misunderstand what's being said when we translate the word law, Torah, as law. Really, it's best translated as instruction. Thus says, um, thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretches them out, who spreads forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, spirit to those who walk on in it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. This is the prophet Isaiah listening in to the very counsel of the Godhead. There is a conversation taking place within the Godhead that God enabled Isaiah to hear. And, and, and it says here, I the Lord have called you in righteousness. This is, I believe, God the Father speaking to God the Son. And I will hold your hand and I will give, keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. Listen to this. To open blind eyes. To bring out prisoners from the prison and those who sit in darkness on the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name. Look at this, you think, how would I summarize the ministry of Jesus? From the Godhead perspective, what is God doing? He's gonna send his son, and his son, there's two aspects to it, we won't dwell upon when it says the people, he's talking about the Jewish people, Sometime maybe we can open that, but for now let's think about this verse. As a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison and those who sit in darkness from the prison house, the prison cell. So not only opening the eyes, but also um, bringing out the prisoners from the prison. What prison is this? What prison is it that needs us to, in order to walk free from, our eyes need to be opened? And to, to understand that, we haven't got time to fully open it, but it relates back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. The temptation of the enemy. Listen to his words. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. Your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And we know that when our first parents obeyed the instruction, the temptation um, of Satan, the serpent, the dragon, the adversary, we came under his authority. We came under his authority. And as astonishing as it seems, God, the enemy, became the God of this world. Remember the temptation where um, Satan took Jesus up to the you know, high mountain and said, all this I will give you um, because it has been given to me. Jesus didn't question that, didn't dispute that. Um, and we, so we see this issue that Satan became the god of his age, and what he does is draws people into darkness and ever into increasing levels of bondage. Jesus has come to release the captives, to open their eyes. Satan said, I'm going to open your, you know, if you take of it, your, your eyes will be opened. He lied. It's always a mixture of truth. Their eyes were closed. Darkness came in. They started to rely upon, you know, instruction. Bang, bang, bang. Before they had, they had communion. They had flow. They had connectedness. They walked with God in the garden in, in, in the cool of the day. They, I believe they heard him singing in the garden. Maybe they joined in his song. I don't know, it's just beautiful, you know. And when, when they obeyed his command, the enemy's command, their eyes were shut as far as the Spirit 
reality and you know what God intended for them, and the enemy drew them into darkness. Okay, so now turn to Acts twenty six because um, I can see that I'm. Uh, what I wanted to do was spend a little bit of time looking at Paul a little bit more um, because he, um, you know, when he encountered, he got knocked off, he, I keep saying he got knocked off his horse, Enough, the scripture doesn't say anything about a horse, you know, so, so it was a bit like Christmas tradition, you find yourself saying stuff and you say, hold on, who says they were three magi? They were three gifts. Not magi, there were loads of them. Anyway, um, so, but Paul speaks about this light that came down from, you know, that shone around him from heaven, and uh, Jesus, uh, you know, really um, challenged him, and uh, Ananias comes to, comes to him and restores his sight. He was blinded by that light. Um, but then if we come to Acts 26, Paul is... And it's 27 years later, by the way. This is 27 years had passed since the Damascus Road experience. And now, and with a, I don't know, do you, do you notice that you know, sometimes God says something to you, and at the time you think you know what he said. And you walk with it a little while, and you suddenly realise he said a whole lot more. Do you, do you realize, do you, do you, do you, have you experienced that? Well, here's Paul decide, you know, um, explaining to King Agrippa what happened on the road. But, sorry, I, I, yeah, 23 years later. 26, verse 9. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this I also did in Jerusalem. Many of the saints I shut up in prison having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them, even to foreign cities. And then, you know, for the sake of time, you know, it, it, he then explains he was going to Damascus to, with authority from the chief priests, and Jesus challenges him, but listen to this. It's not mentioned in Acts chapter, the first place where we went to. But rise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you've seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the people. I think Acts 42, two groups of people talked about there. The people, the Jewish people. And from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you, listen to his commission, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the authority of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance amongst those who are sanctified by faith in me. To open their eyes, and what we're seeing here is Paul is making it very plain that where there is darkness, the authority of Satan is operative. You understand? He said, I'm going to turn you from darkness to light, from the authority of Satan to the authority of God. And it's as if one of the principles by which the enemy operates is... He has permission to traffic where there's darkness. And he seduces, beguiles, deceives, through temptation, all the rest of it. He pull, in order to increase his reign, if you like, and increase his influence, he pulls the people into further, further darkness, so that... His authority increases, 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 and eventually you read the book in Revelation, a good number of the population bow and worship him ultimately. They, they give their allegiance to him. That's what he wants. He wants the worship. Um, but Jesus, you know, if you compare Isaiah 40, um, 42, the verse, this is what Paul's quoting from. It's what, where he's, you know, where, what Jesus is referring to, to Paul. To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the authority of Satan to the authority of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. What an incredible thing. 
Just think about this. God comes, he sends his ministers, and they, we were part of this ministry, by the way, are the people that we're sent to. Our commission is to open their eyes through various ways, yeah? And through love and truth expressed and shown, and, and, you know, um, and other, other, other ways. But our intent, we're carrying the ministry of Jesus as expressed in Isaiah 42, as repeated by Jesus, here in Acts 26, and your ministry, our ministry is to help God open their eyes so that they turn from darkness to light, come out from them under the authority of Satan, and come under the authority of God. And in that place there is forgiveness, and in that place is a place of belonging where we are set apart as holy by our faith in him. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And I want to say, one of the things that the enemy does is complicate everything. But I pray that we would receive revelation today to understand what I'm talking about isn't complicated.